Washington Journal continues. Our last guest of the morning, Oren Kerr of George Washington University. He teaches at their law school there. And Mr. Kerr, the reason we brought you on, it was that the Supreme Court heard a case concerning search warrants. Could you give us the setup, so to speak, as far as what the case deals with? Yes, this is a case coming from Kentucky. Uh, it's about a drug arrest that occurred in an apartment building. And the issue is whether the police were allowed to enter the apartment without a search warrant. Now, a search warrant is a court order that a judge approves that says, you're allowed to go enter into this uh, place and search for evidence or arrest people. Uh, and the government had uh, reason to think that there were crimes occurring inside the apartment, but they didn't have a search warrant. And the issue in the case was whether the police were allowed to search the apartment without the warrant or whether they needed to stop, go get a warrant, and then come back and search the apartment at a later time. So the step back, the police are chasing a criminal. Criminal goes into an apartment building and goes into one of two apartments, but the police don't know uh, what happens at, or which apartment at the time. That's correct. Tell us what happens after that, though, as far as the, 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 the door they knocked on. So the police approach one of the apartments and they smell the odor of marijuana coming from the apartment. Uh, they had just had an undercover buy crack cocaine in the apartment building and they didn't know if the person who'd sold the crack cocaine had gone into one apartment or the other. Turns out they picked the wrong apartment. The, the apartment where the odor of marijuana was coming from was a different apartment. They approached that apartment though, knocked on, knocked, banged on the door, announced, we're the police, and then there's some testimony that they may have said that they demanded to be let inside, other testimony that they didn't, that's kind of uncertain. But they banged on the door and then heard a noise inside. Uh, at that point, the officers broke in through the door, uh, uh, searching on the theory that there was an emergency going on inside, what the Supreme Court has called exigent circumstances. So this is an established exception to the warrant requirement that says if there's some emergency, if there's some reason for the police that they can't wait to get a warrant, then they can enter. And one of the classic reasons for exigent circumstances is for the destruction of evidence. So what the police testified was that they thought the marijuana was going to be destroyed because the people inside, upon hearing the knock, were going to go destroy the evidence. And the issue is whether they were allowed to justify their search given that the noise that they heard was probably a response to their own knock. So the, the, the legal issue that the Supreme Court was playing with is whether there's a, a doctrine, and if so, what it looks like, of police-created exigent circumstances. Uh, and that was the legal issue that the Supreme Court was debating. Because there was already a standard set up. So the question is, why is the court hearing this case? So the lower courts have uh, disagreed as to what the test should be for police-created exigent circumstances. The concern motivating this area of law is that if the Fourth Amendment requires the police to stop and get a warrant, even if they have reason to think there's evidence inside a home, but if the police can then take steps to create some sort of emergency, then the requirement that they get a warrant doesn't have a lot of meaning. So the big issue the justices were struggling with is, okay, if you say the police aren't allowed to do certain things to create the emergency, on which they rely to, to conduct the search, what's the test? What does the Constitution require in terms of what law are the lower courts supposed to apply to determine when the police-created ex exigency is improper and the police can't rely on it and have to get a warrant? With all that in mind, compare it to the Fourth Amendment, which, which you know, but it says the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizures. Right, so this is an aspect of the Fourth Amendment, uh, one of the original aspects of the Bill of Rights. The issue here is what is the privacy right in the home? And I guess the search word, or the key word is unreasonable uh, in this case. The key word is unreasonable, yes. At the oral argument before the Supreme Court last week, the justices were trying to figure out what does unreasonable mean in the specific setting of the police uh, uh, knowing that there's evidence inside an apartment and hearing this noise. Does, is it reasonable for them to enter or is it only reasonable for them to go back, find a judge, get a warrant, and then return to execute the search after getting a warrant? Search and seizures and the Supreme Court uh, revisiting uh, search warrants is the topic for our last uh, segment this morning. If you have questions about this, here's uh, your chance to find out more. 202-737-0002 for Democrats, 202-737-0001 for Republicans, 202-628-0205. For independence, journal at cspan.org is our email, and off of Twitter, it is cspanwj. Judge Scalia, or Justice Scalia, 
said that this is a simple matter because in the case where the police op went to the wrong door, the residents in there could have said, you can't come in until you have a, a warrant. Is it simple as that? One of the issues the justices were grappling with is what is a reasonable response to pol the police knocking at the door? Um, the, no the police knock at the door, they bang on your door. What is a response that a, an innocent person might have? So the lawyer for the defendant in the case said that could include not doing anything. That could include deciding they don't want to open the door. Justice Scalia, very, very active in the oral argument, and he seemed to think that the reasonable thing to do was to open the door, tell the police, I'm sorry, I don't want to consent to a search, come back with a warrant. And w one of the difficult issues here is that, of course, it's not like the justices have ever uh, 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 had these sorts of problems themselves, or at least not terribly often. You, you don't end up off it on the Supreme Court if you're uh, often getting a, a knock on the door from the police saying, please, uh, 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 we demand that you open the door. So this was a difficult question for them. They're trying to figure out what is a reasonable reaction uh, for people to have, and then also what kind of reasonable limitations should we expect to impose on the police. So one of the big issues here is it's very common for the police to knock on the door, uh, ask to speak to somebody, and just ask questions. They call it a knock and talk procedure. Uh, that's generally been considered lawful, and, and the, one of the issues was whether the police could do that. And if they could do that, whether there's a difference if they bang on the door instead of knock on the door, if they demand entry versus if they announce they're the police, if they yell they're the police versus they say they're the police, uh, where exactly is the line as to what the police are allowed to do in these circumstances to conduct the search without a warrant? It seems to be a case about nuance. It's very much a nuanced question. And, 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 and what had made the issue very difficult is that the lower courts had come up with all of these different approaches to this problem. Some had said you focus on whether the police, uh, whether the, the reaction to the police uh, knocking is foreseeable. Others had focused on whether the police conduct was legal. Uh, so there were lots of different tests. And, and what made it all the more difficult is under any of these different tests, it wasn't entirely clear how it would apply in practice. So well, they were trying to figure it out during the argument. We'll take some calls uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about the case as we uh, go on with our guest, Oren Kerr of George Washington University, a law professor there. Ron Toole, Illinois, uh, Republican line. Mike, you are up first. Go right ahead. Well, thank you for this <clears throat> kind of a hot button issue with me. Um, I remember it's been a few years back. It's a moonless night. It, three in the morning in a town with no street lights and I get pulled over by a police officer because he could not tell if I was wearing my seat belt quote unquote and of course that's the uh, camel's nose under the tent for anything else um, it, it's sad to say but it seems to me we're getting into a society where the police have to they have the ability to stop you for anything. They have the ability to pretty much enter for anything because the laws are so convoluted. And it's not a fair exchange because the police are trained to make a voluntary conversation appear involuntary. So the issue that the Supreme Court was looking at last week uh, was specifically in the setting of search warrants executed at a home little bit different from the situation of an automobile stop uh, where generally no warrant is required. So this particular issue would not uh, 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 arise. Um, although uh, uh, the caller is absolutely right, the police have a lot of leeway to make uh, what they call consensual stops, to ask questions. And, and the idea behind the law is that anyone can ask somebody else a question. There's nothing wrong with that. Surely the police can as well. Uh, and I think the caller is right that that may be an, a, a nice theory, but in practice, uh, when a police officer walks up to somebody, uh, uh, it's, it's assumed that you have to respond to the police officer. They certainly create the impression, typically, that it's not an optional conversation. Uh, and that's one of the issues in the case, uh, because in this particular case, the police banged on the door, announced that they're the police. One of the issues that the Supreme Court was grappling with is, how does a person respond to that? Is it just like somebody comes by, uh, you know, a traveling salesman or something like that, and if you don't want to respond, you don't have to respond? Uh, or is, is the police knocking and announcing something so different that uh, a, a totally different response is, is justified? Uh, that's one of the big issues that the, the justices were trying to figure out. Uh, off of Twitter, uh, one of the viewers asked, citizens are not required, or says citizens are not required to talk to the police and adds it's better not to. 
Yeah, absolutely. The, the citizens are not uh, uh, required to talk to the police. And in fact, I was surprised at the oral argument. Uh, one of the comments of the defense attorney was uh, that uh, if, the, if you don't want to knock, answer the door when the police knock, you don't have to answer the door. And, and Justice Scalia, to my surprise, responded that, that he thought that was an odd Re reaction and it, it seemed to me that that's a perfectly plausible reaction the Constitution uh, does not require you to answer questions by the police and if you're at home and the police knock on the door you're not required to answer what made this case more complicated was that the specific issue was when do the police create exigent circumstances so what made this case special is that there was a, a noise in response to the knocking at the door that the officers thought was consistent with somebody trying to destroy the evidence. And the Supreme Court of Kentucky had said that that noise could not be considered uh, to try to justify exigent circumstances. And the issue uh, that the U.S. Supreme Court was trying, was trying to figure out is whether that was in fact the case. Okay, uh, another uh, viewer asked, Mr. Kerr, can you distinguish between probable cause and reasonable suspicion? Yes, uh, probable cause is the constitutional standard uh, which you can think of as sort of a, a, a reasonable likelihood. There's a, a, a good chance that the evidence will be located there. So when the Constitution requires probable cause, uh, studies have shown maybe a 60% chance that the evidence is likely to be there when the, when the government actually obtains probable cause. Uh, in contrast, reasonable suspicion is some sort of specific and articulable facts that there's something afoot, but it's a much lower degree of suspicion. So it could just be there's something fishy about the situation. There's something in a way a person is acting uh, or, or behaving that suggests there's something that's slightly uh, off in the case. So that's maybe you can't really quantify it, but you can think of that as maybe 20, 30 uh, percent rather than 60 percent. And reasonable suspicion is the standard for stopping uh, somebody on the street and, and talking to them for a police officer to detain them for a few moments and probable cause is the standard to actually search them. Just uh, St. Louis, Missouri, James, Democrats line. How you doing in the morning, guys? Um, where I live, at, there is a overwhelming police force in some places. Like there's a mixture from urban to rural and I've lived everywhere. But everywhere I go, it seems like there's like a, um, um, a air of power with police officers. There's one rural county where there aren't really a mixture of race. And when you cross over their bridge, there are like cops everywhere. And we had uh, some visitors come in one time and write an editorial in our paper, and they were saying it's like a Gestapo. Like, like you're assuming we're going to do wrong. Like, you're assuming that when I cross this bridge, my plates are bad. I don't have a seatbelt on. Like, where are our rights? Like, I don't like the words discretion or reasonable. That was on a flip of a coin, and I believe that Lady Justice is blind. One of the issues that the Supreme Court has to grapple with in, in interpreting the Fourth Amendment is that the same rules are going to apply in radically different communities. So uh, a rural community, an urban community, a high crime neighborhood, a low crime neighborhood. And this is a real challenge, I think, for the Supreme Court. The Constitution requires that unreasonable searches and seizures be prohibited and reasonable searches and seizures be allowed. Uh, so that reasonable, unreasonable line, the Constitution requires the justices to uh, I interpret. A and the issue in Kentucky versus King was really how do you figure that out in a case specifically of knocking on a door and hearing noise inside. So it's applying a general principle uh, to a specific set of facts. And, and I did want to also point out um, in, in this particular case, I, I did uh, talk to King's attorneys uh, uh, leading up to the briefing of this case. So I was consulted on one side of this case, although obviously what I'm saying here today is, is my own personal opinion. Uh, Justice uh, Ginsburg had said this over the overall case, said that uh, she was concerned because, quote, they go to the apartment building and sniff at every door. Yes, so this is, this is the concern uh, from the defendant's side of the case. What, if the rule is that the police are allowed to do anything lawful at the door, uh, they can knock and say, we're about to come in, and then listen. And they might not have any particular reason to think that there's drugs uh, or any particular evidence of crime inside. What's to stop them from doing that? And then upon hearing some reaction, say, well, now we've got probable cause. Now we think we can enter and, and to enter inside to the home. So one of the problems with any of the different options, and I don't think the Supreme Court really found a good option in this one hour oral argument last week, is, is how do you limit the police so they're not using 
this to circumvent the warrant protection. So the, the, what you don't want is for the police to say, oh, we don't get warrants because whenever we have probable cause, we just knock, hear a noise, and then break in. You absolutely would not want that. But if you're not going to go to that extreme, what about a rule that allows them to knock, and what line do you draw? And so, so there are concerns on, on both sides, really. As far as the, what you heard from the justices, what kind of questions were being asked? What kind of vibe did you get from them as far as this case was concerned? Yeah, I think uh, the justices on the whole were pretty skeptical of uh, the defense attorney's case. They seem to be inclined to rule in favor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Uh, on a pretty narrow ground, though, my guess is that they're going to send this case back to the uh, Kentucky courts saying, uh, uh, you have to look at a bigger picture here. You can't just say that the, the noise that was heard can't be relied on because of the, the knocking. Um, that's my, my guess, although um, it's a little difficult to get a feel for where all the justices are in that particular case because uh, some of the justices are more vocal than others. And in particular, Justice Scalia was just absolutely involved in the oral argument here. He was just you know, grabbing onto this argument and being very active. And it may be that he's not one of the votes in the center of this particular court on this particular issue. And if so, you might look at his questions and think, well, it's clear Kentucky's going to win, when it may be that other justices that are more quiet actually are, are inclined to vote for King. So, what, so it's hard to tell. What do we get from Justices uh, Sotomayor and Kagan? Uh, Justices Sotomayor and Kagan were more sympathetic to King's side, the defendant's side. Uh, they were both raising concerns about uh, what would be the implications of the government's rule in terms of allowing the government to uh, uh, knock on every door and, and really would this gut the warrant requirement. So they seem to be more inclined to uh, see, the, see things from King's perspective. At the same time, it's very hard to tell from the questions at the oral argument. So a lot of times justices will uh, uh, play devil's advocate or they'll ask questions to explore the strengths and weaknesses of both sides. So, so you can't tell from a specific question mm -hmm. just what a justice is thinking. New York, New York, thank you for waiting. Abrams on our independent line. Good morning, gentlemen. Good, mo good morning, Mr. Kerr. I, I have a quick comment and then a question for you, Mr. Kerr. Um, I live here in New York and it seems that there are two types of or policing or justice system for, 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 for the class of people here in New York. I don't know about the rest of the, uh, uh, the country, but here in the city and the state of New York, if you are a black person, the system treats you differently. If you are not a black person, a Caucasian, they treat you much better. For instance, way back, I think it was in 1986 or 85, the Central Park Yoga case, when this lady, reasonably educated, intelligent, good-looking, was raped. And then uh, I think she was raped and beaten and left on the side. And there was a pressure, tremendous pressure here on the uh, on the police to find the suspect. They went down to Harlem in one of the poor neighborhoods and grabbed five young men, and they made up the stories on them. And the, and the short part of the matter is that all of those young men were later on exonerated. They were free from jail, but by that time the damage has been done to their parents and the people who love them. And then quite recently, upstate New York, there was a law, I think it is New York Constitution, or maybe it is just a thing that says a man's home is his castle, blah, 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 blah. He has the right to uh, protect it. So, uh, uh, caller, so what, what's your question for our guest, sir? Is, is there ever a time when the police did not create an emergency or a reason to do what they want to do? Well, well, first let me say that the, the problems of racial bias in the criminal justice system have been uh, a, a deep problem as long as there has been a criminal justice system. So these are issues that uh, are being dealt with and have you know, the government continues to struggle with at the state and federal level. Uh, I think we're getting better, uh, but, but clearly a lot of progress still needs to be made. Uh, in, in terms of whether the police can kind of do whatever they want, uh, there are uh, a couple concerns. In part, this particular case is about that question, sort of how much police power uh, do the police actually have to conduct the search without first going to a judge. So the, the purpose of the warrant requirement is to say that the police have to go to a judge who's not involved in the case, who doesn't have any incentive uh, to, to uh, give the police the warrant and say, here's the case we have for searching the home can we search the home and then the judge has to make that call so so the warrant requirement is traditionally a very strong and important limitation on the power of the police and and then the the difficulty becomes and the reason why the exigent circumstances exception exists is that if the police are outside the door 
and they hear the evidence being destroyed. For example, imagine they hear people inside say, hey, the cops are outside. Let's, let's flush all the marijuana down the toilet. And they start to hear toilets flushing. Well, it'd be nice if the police got a warrant generally, but we shouldn't expect them to say, hey, could you hold on for a second. We'll be back in a few hours, because by the time they come back, the evidence will be gone. So, so it's a very diff difficult balancing issue, uh, and, and how the law is being applied in practice is absolutely critical, and, and the bias questions remain. But, but in the end, I, I think we really do have a question of uh, line drawing of exactly how much uh, police power the, the government should be allowed. Uh, Linda adds this morning that that's the problem with reasonable suspicion. It's too subjective, not objective. Yeah, the reasonable suspicion requirement is a, is a, a fairly low requirement. It is uh, relatively easy for a police officer to justify a stop based on reasonable suspicion. Um, importantly, the probable cause requirement is higher. Uh, to, to conduct a search of a home, the, the government's going to need probable cause in most circumstances. It's actually not entirely clear if probable cause is required for exigent circumstances cases. Uh, that was one of the issues that uh, there was a little bit of uncertainty about at the oral argument. But uh, the standard for searching a home generally is significantly higher than the standard for stopping a person uh, on the street, for example, and requiring them to uh, answer questions. Market Heights, Illinois, Republican line. David, good morning. Yeah, thank you for C-SPAN. Um, this uh, court case is really uh, going, you know, I'm going, waiting to see the outcome of this. Uh, I had the Illinois State Police come to my residential family home. We own it. Not even the bank owns it. We own it. And uh, they came in. I asked them for a warrant three times. They said they didn't need one. I had children. They said if I shut the door that they, they would kick it in. I was in fear for my family and my children. And uh, they just said, sorry, I uh, didn't find anything, did nothing wrong, uh, just left and nothing happened and uh they don't w want to apologize or anything and uh the only choice we have is to go to federal court and the one more thing i'd like to add if i get a comment on what i just said um you know we always think that these police all of them aren't bad but we uh people got to realize that they're human like everybody else they lie cheat and uh some of them are corrupt as well thank you for c-span uh, so the, the caller is bringing out a, a specific case, and of course it's difficult to, to know what exactly happened in that one case. It's very hard for me to, to, to tell one way or the other. Um, one of the difficulties of the Fourth Amendment is that it's quite difficult in fact-specific. So, you know, if, if an individual in the home, for example, was on probation, that could lead to one set of rules. Um, if the uh, search was conducted for family services reasons, could lead to a different set of rules. If somebody uh, o opened the door and said, sure, come on in, who lived at the home, that could be another set of rules. So, so there are very complicated rules uh, throughout Fourth Amendment law. Uh, and the, the case in, in Kentucky versus King is dealing with uh, a, clearly an example of the, for, uh, the police breaking entry for law enforcement reasons. So this is them knocking on the door uh, and then breaking in because they're trying to find drugs. So, so it's a core law enforcement type of case uh, rather than uh, potentially a different sort of set of facts. Uh, Miami, Florida. Thanks for holding on for uh, Oren Kerr of, uh, and talking about the Fourth Amendment. And uh, just want to let you know that uh, as you're calling, you can also uh, check our lines. And I also want, Mr. Orenker, before we go to uh, the caller in Miami, a uh, question. Uh, the second part, or at least the, the finishing part of the Fourth Amendment is, uh, search and seizures shall not be violated, no warrant shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. It seems like it's really laid out here. Yeah, the, the requirements for obtaining a search warrant are quite detailed in the text of the Constitution. It's kind of remarkable that there's that level of detail. A and that reflects a uh, reaction to the English practices at the time of the Revolution, where the English king was uh, uh, allowing what were called general warrants. It's basically a piece of paper that said the king's officials can go anywhere and look mm -hmm. for anything, and the, the king's officials would sign the warrant, and, and, and there were very few limitations. So the reaction to that was to say, no, the government is not allowed to obtain a warrant unless they have probable cause, uh, unless the warrant is specific as to where the police can go, and unless the warrant is specific as to what the government is looking for. So those are written into the face of the warrant, and those are facial requirements that were uh, enacted in 1791, and they're still very much the law today. Miami, Florida, go ahead. Uh, yes, good morning, sir. Thank you for C-SPAN, and thank you for your reports, and uh, Saturday is a wonderful. wonderful. 
Uh, my name is Reynaldo Valdez. I'm with the Miami-Dade County Community Relations Board. And uh, last week, coincidentally, we had a, a meeting of all the uh, chiefs of police in the, uh, different, from the different communities uh, together at the county for a meeting regarding the, uh, 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 police uh, showing up to homes and uh, 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 busting the door, entering uh, uh, laying down children to the ground, uh, putting the, uh, 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 their uh, large weapons to their to their bodies or their heads, and and going through the the homes, uh, having the children lead the uh, police. Uh, this has been in several instances. Uh, in one instance, uh, uh, they uh, they uh, show up, surround the home. Uh, there is no marked police. They're dressed in black. No identifications, no search warrants, nothing is shown after they go through the house and, 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 and tear everything apart and break the door down. Uh, they've, they've, uh, they've, have, they, they, they've even had an individual in custody for 11 months okay. before they searched this home. Okay, thanks, Cole. So, uh, at least based on what the caller described, sounds like a situation that the Constitution would require a warrant for, although, of course, as I said, it's kind of hard to know in a specific case. Uh, it may be worth talking a little bit about uh, the role of search warrants. Why have a requirement uh, of going to the judge beforehand? Um, one reason, of course, is just to make sure that the search is justified uh, and that the search that occurs is going to be narrow. If the police have to go to a judge beforehand and say, here's our case, and the judge has to approve that case, then there's more of an assurance that uh, the search is legitimate, that there's a good reason for it, and that the search will be narrow. And then beyond that, the, uh, obtaining a search warrant triggers a bunch of procedural protections. For example, if you're in the home and the police are going to execute a search, they have to knock and announce their presence, wait for the door to be opened at least a, a short period of time. Uh, usually they have to do that. Sometimes they can circumvent that requirement, but usually it is required. The warrant itself will explain to the homeowner why the search is occurring and, and, and assure the homeowner that the police entering are in fact the police because, of course, if you're a homeowner and people enter in and they say they're the police, you may or may not believe that to be true. Uh, there's also a requirement that an inventory be left behind of any property that was taken after the warrant has been executed. So there are a lot of procedural protections that go along with the warrant requirement and whether they're required in, this, in a case like we have in Kentucky versus King uh, is the issue that's uh, uh, going to be decided by the Supreme Court in this particular case. McLean, Virginia, Republican line, Edward. Yeah, hi, thanks very much for being here. I love C-SPAN. Anyway, a couple things. I thought the uh, Supreme Court and appellate court decided last year that the smell of pot, quote unquote, uh, emanating from a car was not probable cause for the police officer to actually enter the car and, you know, per pursue other, I would assume, induct, you know, try to find out what, what was in the car. That, I thought, was decided. Number two, in terms of um, obstruction of justice, um, I refused to open my door when my girlfriend's ex-boyfriend called and said that I was abusing my girlfriend, which didn't happen because she wasn't even there. They busted in my door and arrested me for obstruction of justice. That I don't think is correct. And they didn't. They never paid for the front door. Well, let me focus on uh, the first comment and then just the very end there. So uh, the Supreme Court did not uh, uh, conclude that uh, uh, the smell of marijuana coming from a car is, it means that the car can't be searched. Um, actually, the, the smell of marijuana coming from the car generally would be probable cause to believe that there's marijuana in the car, and then that would justify a, a search of the car without a warrant under uh, a doctrine called the automobile exception that goes back to a 1925 decision called Carroll versus United States. Uh, there may have been a lower court decision which had some variation on this, but, but generally speaking, if there's marijuana in the car and the smell of it uh, uh, is clear to the officers from the outside, uh, they're going to conduct a search of the car for that marijuana, and the Constitution allows that. Um, one, one point I did want to also uh, uh, mention uh, in response to the last comment that the caller made, uh, the police not paying for the damage to the destruction of the property uh, uh, it turns out that's mostly an issue of state law. So 
there are some state laws that uh, give people who've been subjects of search uh, state means of, of seeking compensation for restoring their property because uh, executing a warrant is in fact a very physical thing. Uh, the police uh, sometimes break down a door, uh, oftentimes will uh, uh, rip open uh, things or, or, or can damage property, damage furniture. And, and there are very different state laws as to whether uh, they can get, people can get compensation for that or not. Uh, Jen Ness asks in a general sense, how often are the wrong homes searched? It's, it's hard to know. Uh, the empirical studies that have been done suggested that uh, the evidence that was described in the warrant was recovered in searches maybe 60, 65 percent of the time, 70 percent of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it varies based on the jurisdiction and the type of case. Um, so there may be a third of the time a warrant is executed, the evidence described in the warrant is not found. There may be some cases where that evidence isn't found, but other evidence of crime is found. Uh, but it's about two-thirds of the time that the, the evidence that the police are looking for is actually found there. New Orleans, Arthur on our independent line. Uh, good morning, guys. Uh, my question is, um, there was a case a um, long time ago where police officers went to an apartment complex to investigate a shooting. Upon going to the apartment complex, they went into one of the buildings and looked around, and the gentleman had several stereo electronic equipment. They wrote down serial numbers and find out that the equipment was stolen and of course arrested this gentleman for uh, theft of property. Uh, my question is, when the police officers first went to those, that complex, they were running after someone. They knocked on the door because they smelled marijuana. Now, they, 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 got, they got the guys for marijuana, but did they catch who they were running after? And also, with that case that happened a long time ago, where the Supreme Court was also overseeing what the gentleman was caught for theft, but they never investigated really the shooting. So is it something where the officers are getting what they can get when they're not getting what they originally went for? Or are they held accountable for, well, did you get with your original reason for going into that apartment complex for? Under a, a Fourth Amendment doctrine called the Plain View Doctrine, uh, if the government comes across evidence unrelated to what they're expecting and the incriminating nature of what they found is immediately apparent, they can seize the evidence that they find and they can bring charges based on what they've seen. So in the Kentucky versus King case, uh, the officers are looking for the crack cocaine dealer. In fact, they come across King in his apartment smoking marijuana and charge him with marijuana offenses. Uh, so it was not the original crime. It happened to be another crime that they, they in effect stumbled across when they approached the door and smelled the marijuana inside. Uh, it's not clear from the opinion in the lower courts, as far as I know, of, as to whether the uh, crack cocaine dealer was caught. I, I, I don't recall seeing anything in the materials in that case as to whether, in fact, he was. Uh, so this is, in the Kentucky versus King case, it's uh, 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 an investigation into one crime leading to evidence being discovered against another crime. And the Fourth Amendment generally does allow the government to uh, bring charges on the second crime that they come across in the course of the first crime, so long as the Fourth Amendment was not violated in the, in the uh, procedures taken to get to the evidence of the second crime. So, so what's the, the legal issue in the Kentucky versus King case is whether the Fourth Amendment was violated in getting to the evidence of the second crime. Miami, Florida. Thanks for waiting. Uh, George, Democrats yeah. line. Hello. Go ahead. Yes, good morning. Uh, first line caller. Uh, here in Florida, if I just walk to the street and for no probable cause get stopped and I don't have a uh, ID, a driver's license, can they uh, detain me or arrest me? Number two, if I'm driving and for no uh, probable cause get stopped, uh, and, and they usually ask for uh, to, to search the auto, can I decide not to and uh, not have any problem just if there's no problem cause. Thank you very much. Uh, two great questions. So uh, let me start with the second question. Uh, the automobile stop will generally be justified under some sort of a traffic violation idea. So the, the Supreme Court has said that if the police are enforcing the traffic laws, they can stop a car uh, in order to uh, enforce the traffic laws, maybe write a ticket for the traffic violation. Uh, and the police uh, absolutely use this to make stops that are not, in fact, good faith stops to enforce the traffic laws. They're looking for evidence of other crimes. And the Supreme Court actually has said that's, that's okay. 
Uh, in terms of the police asking for consent, uh, the police will often say, do you mind if I search your car or something like that? And you have an absolute right to say, officer, I respect your authority. However, I decline consent to searches. Just say, I don't consent. Um, and and uh, you have an absolute right to do that. Uh, and and um, a lot of people do consent to searches. In fact, a lot of people who have a lot of evidence to hide consent to searches on the thinking that if they agree to consent to a search, then maybe the officer will think, well, somebody who consents must not have anything to hide. Uh, police officers know this, so they ask the question knowing perfectly well uh, that a lot of people will consent even if they do have evidence. Um, and then the caller also asked about uh, stopping, uh, being stopped and asked questions. Uh, so the standard for a police stop is reasonable suspicion. It's very difficult as a citizen to know if the police have reasonable suspicion about you. You don't know what uh, they have seen, you don't know what they may have misperceived. Uh, so the thing to do in those circumstances is to comply with the police orders. If an officer tells you to stop uh, or tells you to stay there, you absolutely do that. Uh, but if an officer starts asking you questions, uh, you can say, I'm sorry, I respect your authority, but I would rather not answer your questions. Constitutionally, you're absolutely allowed to do that. Crescent City, California. Uh, Denny on our Republican line. Yes. Your answer, go yes. ahead. Yes, I'm, I'm Denny Haddad in Crescent City, California, and I've had these illegal search and seizures presented to me. Uh, this knock order in California, they knock and they just come in your house. Well, I got a doorbell, that, you know, on my house, and if I'm upstairs, uh, you can't hear someone knocking on the door. But I've had my house completely raided and searched and armed uh, 15 at least uh, sheriffs come through with automatic weapons going through my house all over a blight over blight gives them the uh, a judge gives them a search warrant one question i want to know is those search warrants do they have to be signed by a judge that are legible to read can you do do they have to have does a judge have to sign his name that you can read, or can they just put little hash marks there on the search warrant that absolutely nobody could read? So search warrants require the signature of a sitting judge. Um, however, judges like doctors, like a lot of people have, uh, often can have terrible handwriting that is completely incomprehensible. Uh, so there can be a scratch line that is in fact a judge's signature. The real issue is whether it is in fact a judge's signature. So if the government has obtained a search warrant and they don't have a judge's signature or they faked a judge's signature, that is a very serious Fourth Amendment violation. Uh, any evidence discovered would be suppressed and actually in a circumstance like that a civil case would very likely to be brought uh, suing the police officers and, and, and money could be recovered in that situation. However, if the warrant was actually signed by a judge and it just so happens that the judge has, has bad handwriting, uh, then the warrant is also, also valid. There are also some circumstances uh, where a judge can uh, authorize the warrant over the phone. Uh, that's allowed under the federal rules and I, I think is allowed under a lot of state rules. In those circumstances, there won't be an actual signature, but uh, again, the issue ultimately is whether a magistrate judge did, in fact, approve the warrant. Houston, Texas. Democrats lying yes, to Go ahead. Yes. Uh, November. Hello? Go ahead. You're on. Yes. In November, uh, two police officers dressed as appliance repairmen came to my door to issue an arrest warrant. Uh, I was attempting to comply with the arrest warrant, and one of the officers puts his way in and said he had the right to do so. Uh, when I contacted my state representative, uh, my state legislator, and my congressman to this date, I still haven't got a response as to what my rights are. How do I go about finding out what my rights are and whether or not, uh, at what point does a arrest warrant become a search warrant? So uh, under a case called Payton versus New York, a Supreme Court case from I think it was 1980 or 1981, uh, the Fourth Amendment requires the police to obtain an arrest warrant 
to execute uh, an arrest at a person's home, uh, and that arrest warrant allows the government to enter the home in order to execute the warrant. So uh, if, they, if the government, in your case, did in fact have an arrest warrant, they were in fact allowed to enter the home uh, in order to effectuate the arrest. That arrest warrant would not allow the government to search the home, uh, for example, rifling through a closet or something like that. Uh, but yes, the arrest warrant does in fact authorize the police to enter the home. It, it would not allow the police to enter somebody else's home where they thought uh, you might be or whoever the warrant was out for might be. Uh, but as long as it's the person whose uh, the warrant is out for and it's their home, yes, they're allowed to enter the home to, to execute that arrest warrant. So as far as this case is concerned, now that it's heard, um, when is it going to be decided upon and what are the implications depending on the outcome? So the case will be decided probably by the end of June. Uh, there's no timeline that the justices have to follow, but by tradition they decide all the cases from a Supreme Court term by about the end of June every year, so we'll know in a few months uh, what, what the outcome is. In terms of the implications, it's really hard to know because it depends on how broadly or how narrowly the Supreme Court decides to answer the case. So they might say, we enact a broad rule that says here's how you address all police-created exigency cases. In that event, the case becomes very important because that's something that's going to come up a lot and lower courts are going to apply all the time. On the other hand, they might say, we're only going to have a test that applies in this very specific set of circumstances or we're not going to, we're not going to try to bite off more than we can chew. Uh, and in that case, it may end up being a relatively narrow case. So one of the major play, sort of areas that people may not realize is that it's up to the Supreme Court when they decide their cases as to how broadly or how narrowly they rule. So, so in a lot of situations, cases could be big and they could be relatively small. Orrin Kerr of uh, George Washington University, thanks for explaining this for us. Happy to join you.